What's up, guys? It is Dan from Fight Wave, and today I'm joined by somebody who's been a repeat guest on Fight Wave, and some of you guys will know him as one of my favorite bantamweight prospects in the world right now. If you are not a fan of Brady Heastan, make no mistake, after this next fight, I definitely think he will be turning some heads in his fight against Jake Hadley on October 19. I am privileged to be joined by my good friend Brady Heastan today, joining us from a spacious living room where we will be talking to him about his upcoming fight. Brady, thank you so much for your time. First and foremost, how are you doing, my man? You live in the dream. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm up here in Canada. My buddy's fighting for a BFL title up on UFC Fight Pass. So if you're going to be around, watch him. It's going to be this Friday. But yeah, I'm I'm blessed to be back on the show. Yeah, we've been talking. We were talking about before we started. We've been talking since you were 18 and I was 21. So it's been a hot minute. Yeah, and I got to put a pause in the middle of that before before anyone thinks otherwise. But, you know... Yeah, just for the fans at home watching, first and foremost, you know, talk to me a little bit about the preparation for this fight against Jake Hadley. You know, a fight that I think is great for both of you. You know, both of you are in an interesting spot in your career where both of you are now finally starting to build some momentum. Talk to me a little bit about this fight and just some of the preparation that has gone into it. Yeah, you know, um, based on like my last fights, I feel like I haven't been the most active. So one of the things I really wanted to make happen after this fight is to get uh, right back in there and make another fight happen at least before the end of the year and so when they offered you know the fight was originally supposed to happen in November but apparently it wasn't working on his end and so they were like maybe December or October and I was like I don't care either one and so they came back they're like can you make way October 19th and I said yes yeah, so let's go Definitely. And Brady, just from a fan perspective, it's really been interesting just to navigate your career. Of course, bursting onto the UFC scene at 21, now 25, you know, having a bunch of ups and downs. It's been interesting to navigate your career and just see the performances. When you look at your time in the UFC thus far, what do you kind of make of the time that you've had in the UFC thus far? What are some of the pros and cons or positives and negatives in the time that you've had thus far? You know, I think uh i'll start with cons because i like to end on a good note but i think the con the biggest con i have for myself and you know it's just it just is what it is it's life you know i'm, I'm glad i'm getting it out of the way early but uh just uh the lapse in like consistency just because i was you know injured i've had two injuries i had MRSA and stuff like that so i've really only fought once a year since i was got on the show when i was 21 and now i'm 25 and so just not being able to fight as consistently like i want to like three times a year has been the only downside but you know, I think for the upside, if anyone's watched any of my fights, they know I'm an exciting fighter. I always bring the action, whether I'm getting in a dog fight or I'm dominating, it's always going to be exciting and I'm pushing the pace and there's never a dull moment in any of my fights. Definitely. And I love that you mentioned, obviously, the setbacks. That's two, I think, one year long layoffs, which for a young fighter, definitely it can get onto the mental side, especially when you're trying to, to make a push and really get some experience in the fight game, which you're not, not short of in any sense of the imagination. But it feels like in the three fights we've seen you in the UFC thus far since the finale, you've leveled up with each performance. And I feel like that's really because you haven't wasted any of that gap of time despite not having a fight. So talk to me about just staying diligent in those gaps where, you know, obviously stuff's not working out. You have to kind of stay ready, just be able to to work and compound off of, you know, dealing with these injuries. What has that time in between been like and how have you been able to stay kind of so diligent in the process amidst all these setbacks? Yeah, you know, I think that's the main thing is, yes, I've had time in between fights, but I haven't had any time during training. Like, I'm always training. Like, the only time I take off is maybe when I had my knee surgery. I had to, like, you know, take a few a month off to, like, recover. But I'm never actually out of the gym. I'm always studying tape, and I'm traveling and training, training with high-level guys, you know, whether in, they're in my area. Like, some big up-and-coming guys, like, obviously, my boy Ashton's Friday and Friday, you know, Christian Strong. I get over there with Chase Hooper's guys um even like the bare knuckle champ over in montana i've been training with him quite a bit um and then also going down to vegas and training with guys like marab aljamain you know uh vince morales those guys and so cody Steele, he's gonna be on all, uh the contender series so the thing is is even though i haven't been fighting as consistently i'm making sure i'm hitting all the boxes i'm training working on my diet working on my strength conditioning just so every time i get out there whether it's three months or whether it's a year i show up as a completely different fighter and i think i've you know i've kept that promise to myself and to the fans and every time i fight you know i i have show another layer to myself and i put on a banger obviously i got performance of the night last time so i feel like that's just the beginning and uh I, i've always wanted to be it's always number one is win and number two is be entertaining so i feel like i checked both those boxes in my three UFC fights so far. 
Definitely. And if, if I remember correctly, just for the fans and, you know, just looking at the indicator of being an entertaining fighter, your fight against Ricky Tercios was one of the most entertaining fights I've watched from two amazing young prospects at the time. I got to put that out there for any fans who maybe haven't seen that fight. Do go watch it. And on top of that, you mentioned training in two very elite rooms. Obviously, up in Spokane, you've got your great core group of guys and great mentors. But also in Syndicate MMA in Las Vegas, you've got such an elite room there. There's a photo of you, Muin Gafarov, Marab, you know, yourself, Aljamain Sterling. And I'm missing one more person off the top of my head. But I know that that room... It's just a very elite room, and there's a lot of guidance you've got very early on in your career. You've got a lot of great veterans around you. What's it been like just having those conversations with guys like Aljamain and Marab, who's fighting for the title in a week from now? Yeah, you know, the biggest one is, I think, Marab. And, like, every time I go down to Syndicate, we're always partners. But I, even though, like, I feel like our bo- like we're a little bit different in our body shape, like style and stuff, but I feel like our, our fighting style is very similar in the fact that we both push a pace and we both are grappling heavy, but we like to strike – we're always, you know, keeping the action going. And so I feel like being able to not like necessarily just talk with him, but like just work with him and see how he functions and seeing these champion level guys and how they like carry themselves and all that stuff is huge. You know, seeing Al Jermaine on the match when he was a champ was just like, it made it more real, you know, it makes it feel like you can do it, especially the way I compete with these guys and the way I'm able to, you know, be good partners and be like, get working with these guys it gave me a lot of confidence and, you know, I know I'm going to be champion one day. And so just being able to see that in the in the training room helps a lot. Definitely. And in terms of just, you know, mentors, I feel like one of the, the guys or the best young fighter veteran dynamic that I've seen in MMA has obviously been you and Michael Chiesa. That's one of my favorite kind of dynamics. It's been like largely shown between the show on the ultimate fighter during your time but also in between the gaps where you guys have just been training together or he's been in the audience watching you fight his i feel like his presence on a young fighter's career is just absolutely remarkable with the experience that he brings but also just the mentorship and guidance that he can provide what's it been like uh, just having him in your corner through all the ups and downs you talk about two lengthy year-long layoffs he's obviously had his fair share of setbacks what has it meant for you to kind of have a guy like Michael and even, you know, Juliana be in your corner during those tough times? Yeah, dude, I think like the biggest thing was I obviously started with tough and, you know, we'd been training with each other before then, but it really, really started with tough. And um, if you watch any of us fight, me, Juliana Pena and Mike Kiesa, we all have very similar fighting styles where we're grappling heavy, submission heavy. And, you know, we all can throw throw hands too at the same time. But, you know, just having their like, the mental side was huge for tough and saying that you got to focus on the fight ahead. It's not about the the long term. It's about the short term and you just got to focus on what's ahead of you. And then now as I've started getting into the UFC, as my career started progressing, just little things that help me get through camp, obviously our fighting style is the same. So they can show me some techniques that work for them. Me and my coach, Rick Little, we can look at their fights and we can see, oh, this works. Okay, let's use this in this fight. You know, oh, Mike fought a southpaw here. Or, I mean, Juliana fought a southpaw here. And this really worked well for her. This could probably work really well with you. And then we just kind of build off of each other. And then at the end of it, having them in the corner, just that veteran experience really helps for sure. Absolutely. And I just wanted to get your thoughts, obviously, on his latest fight. You know, the last fight he had against Tony Ferguson in Abu Dhabi. Of course, a very interesting fight. Uh, just with all that's happened with Tony Ferguson and then people coming in and, you know, a lot of, I guess, expectations from fight fans, you know, how they can be fickle. Was there any conversations between you and Mike about the upcoming fight? And honestly, what were your thoughts on just the performance and just the experience seeing him fight Tony Ferguson and just the overall, you know, vibe in Abu Dhabi? I mean, obviously, if you watch the fight, you knew it was flawless on Mike's part. He maybe got hit once or twice and that's a fight. So that just happens. But the fact that he took him down, took his back and choked him out right away. I don't think looks bad on Tony. It just shows how prepared Mike was for that fight. And, you know, Mike had a good camp. He had, it was like in a good headspace going into that. And so I think just going into it, he we all knew like Tony likes to scramble. Tony likes to do all these things. But if Mike gets a hold of you, then it's it's scary. It's a wrap. And so we knew he was probably going to do some stuff. And then but as soon as Mike got a hold of him, I think everyone on the team was just like, all right, we're good. So as soon as he got the body lock to come down, we're like, OK, it's over. And I think that was just leading up to it. Mike and him were supposed to fight at 55. I think it was like six or so years ago. And so I think it was just full circle and it was cool that they finally got it done. Yeah, no, definitely. And also finally just some momentum out of Spokane, obviously like, 
you look at right now the momentum, you know, Mike coming off a win, you getting back on, on the fights and just having a fight booked, and then Juliana back in the title picture fighting Raquel Pennington at UFC 307. It feels like right now the momentum for Spokane is better than ever before. Talk to me a little bit about just seeing that momentum and just the amount of talent that's come out of such a tiny region. You mentioned Coach Rick Little, his impact, his footprint on the city of Spokane, Washington. What do you make of it? Just the ups and downs with this with this small state that has provided us so much MMA talent. 100%. I think if you look at it, besides Chase Hooper and Jeff Hoagland, I think all the talents came out of Sig Jitsu and, you know, as Rick Little as a coach, even Misha came through before she got in the UFC. Um, Cody Kenzie, Lau Beerbaum, Sam Cecilia Osternet, you know, Mike, Julie, now me. I feel like we don't even have a big gym. Like, no joke. We literally train out of four car garage in the back of an Airbnb. So it's like, I think our gym is the best example of shows you that it's not the facility. It's literally the people and the training that goes into the facility. We don't even have a bag in there, bro. We like literally have old ass wrestling mats and some wall pads. So I think it's all about just not caring what, what the outside is putting the work in and then just, you know, preparing for fights. And that's what we do. And I think that's what's shown. And, you know, the talent's still rolling through. We got a lot of up and coming guys, you know, I'm like, now I'm one of the veterans, I guess you could say from the gym. And so, and I see a bunch of kids coming up, some guys around my age that are like going to be scratching the UFC soon. So it's really fucking cool to see out of our little uh, small gym in Spokane that we've had so many UFC fighters and we will have more UFC fighters um but yeah i think it just shows the work ethic and you know spokane's known as like you know like rough and tough i think no joke i think we were the meth capital of the world at one point or not with meth capital of the fucking u.s i think we had like all like the meth uh drug dealers and stuff all, all were from spokane and so i feel like we we've cleaned up now but i think it just shows how rough and tough we are up here and plus we got cold winners we got good wrestlers and we got sick fighters Definitely. And on top of that, of course, you guys have got just like great weather all around for skiing. I know you've been in the time that you haven't been fighting or training. Oh, yeah. You've oh, been yeah. just skiing. Or, and I, it definitely beats the Vegas heat. I got to say that much. It beats the Vegas heat by any stretch of the imagination. Being able to go up to the slopes and just shred them. Talk to me a little bit about just the time away from fighting. Of course, you know, still very young. I know that a lot of fighters don't want to let the moment pass them by. But what do you kind of get to enjoy from life? Outside of fighting, you know, of, of course, when you have a lot of free time, what do you kind of make with that free time, just being able to enjoy every aspect of life? You know, I, I feel like I do enjoy everything, but I'm like, I'm always scheming. I'm always doing something. So whether I'm I'm training or fighting or the only sport I've done longer than uh, jiu-jitsu is actually skiing. So I've been skiing since I was 18 months old. And so as soon as I could walk, I was thrown on a pair of skis. So every weekend during the winter, I'm up there, you know, trying to find my powder and all that stuff. But outside of that, you know, I've been investing in my house. You know, I bought a duplex and like I'm kind of dabbling in the real estate side of things, too. So I feel like my whole plan, my like long term plan is I want to fight till I'm 35, you know, collect a few titles, create an amazing legacy and then retire in a um, condo somewhere on the ski mountain and just live my life out there in the woods, you know, with a bunch of real estate. And so, yeah, I think fighting's awesome it's not forever and so i'm gonna i'm gonna ride it as long as i can and have fun with it while i can but i'm gonna make sure that the rest of my life after is is fun too definitely and then on top of that of course you mentioned the first ever interview we did brady i was in awe and i guess just like a factor of me living in california i've always every time i gotta have a house update when i talk to brady he stand just about you know california bad housing market spokane amazing housing market homeowner at 21 the first time we spoke now 25 i gotta get the brady he stand house update and just see what the developments are you mentioned a duplex congrats on that continuing to grow, build wealth, and just continue to be the best Brady Heastan you can be. So talk to me a little bit about just a house update. What, what's gravy in the in the nation of Brady Heastan's crib? MTV Cribs edition, Fight Wave style. All right, let's go. So I guess I it's the same house. The only thing is I uh, it had an unfinished basement. And so it was three bedroom, two bath upstairs. And so what I did is I completely converted the basement to a three bedroom, two bath you know, I had plumbing, all that stuff installed. And so now it's a split level duplex with its split yard and everything like that. And so, you know, after every fight, I dump a little bit of money in the house. And now I have something that I can do, like rent it out or do Airbnb with, which I'm going to, you know, hone in after this fight camp and kind of do that. And then I'm in the market, hopefully one, maybe two fights. I think I'm going to buy another house. And so that's, that's like where I'm at right now.
right now. The plan is is to maybe buy one in Vegas because obviously I'm down there training all the time. And so if I want to go train, I'll use that when I'm gone, maybe rent it out or something like that. But uh, yeah, I, I, I feel bad for you just because California is expensive. I feel like I feel like Spokane's expensive compared to some places, but California is a whole nother level, dude. That's crazy. California takes the California definitely takes the cake in terms of just bad housing market right now. And sure. after COVID definitely amplified, but Brady, I want to thank you so much for your time. It's always a privilege to speak with you. And like you mentioned, we've been just chopping it up from a very long time. You know, two young guys, one pursuing the fighting, one pursuing the, you know, the interview media game, I guess, of, of the MMA scene. And it's just been great, great and amazing just to see your development and growth. And I guess on a final note, of course, a lot of setbacks, but I think a lot of positives to take from your career as well, just in terms of having the great people around you, how you've been able to build around the fight game and enjoy it for as long as it lasts. And you've mentioned your eagerness to, you know, just be able to make a climb. You know, you mentioned the frustration of ever since you were 16, wanting to fight two times at least every year up until now and the injuries and setbacks not making that possible or even just the UFC not booking mentioning that eagerness to fight and get in the title picture, get in the rankings and be hungry and prove to people, hey, Brady, he sent has arrived and I'm ready to go. So talk to me a little bit about just the goals, closing out 2024 and of course, continuing that climb for a title. Yeah, I mean, like we talked about earlier, like I'm always in the gym, I'm always training, I'm always trying to get better. So if I'm doing that, might as well be fighting too, especially if I'm winning. If maybe I wasn't winning, maybe I'll be like, okay, I need to take a step back and reevaluate. But I'm winning, I'm doing it exciting, and I'm progressing every fight. And so I'm trying to get in there, and I'm trying to stay in there. And so the fact that um, I had this thing come up in October, I said right, yes right away. I said there was no hesitation. And so, you know, my the rest of my plans for 2024 is at least one more fight. You know, how this fight goes, if I get in there, choke him out or knock him out right away, fuck it, let's do another one in December. But – for sure, next year, I'm trying to fight at least three times, at least three times. And I think after this win, I'll be scratching at the top 15. So beat Jake Hadley. You know, I'll have a few names in mind when I hop on the mic and uh, and then we can get the ball rolling. And once you're in the top 15, you know, it might move a little slower, but every fight means a lot more. And so I feel like once I'm there, you know, that's my time to make some noise. I'll have some big fights and, uh, you know, I'll be the prospect I know I am and then the UFC will know who who the fuck I am and fans will know who the fuck I am. So I'm excited. Yeah, 2025 is going to be a big year for sure. That, that just got me pumped up. I mean, I cannot wait to watch your next fight, Brady. And always a privilege to speak with you, my man. Best of skill, best of luck in your upcoming fight against Jake Hadley on October 19th, guys. Check it out. Do be sure to check out Brady on social media. And if you enjoy this video, do be sure to like, comment, subscribe. It's been me, Dan, from Fight Wave. Have a great day, guys.